Steve Gibson's here. It's time for Security Now, and he's got a great topic for anybody who uses an iPhone or an iPad. Believe it or not, the password managers you're paying for may not be doing the job. We'll talk about how to keep your iOS device secure and all the security news as well, including that big credit card breach, next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. It's time for Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 347, recorded April 4th, 2012. iOS password mismanagers. Security Now is brought to you by Ford, featuring voice-activated Sync App Link. Now you can control select smartphone apps with your voice, helping you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Learn more about the technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. It's time for Security Now, the show that protects you, your loved ones, and everyone you might know against bad stuff on the Internet. And the guy who does it is here, the explainer in chief. What was the other phrase I came up with you for, Steve? No, that's the one, explainer yeah. in chief. That's Mr. That's Steve one. Gibson of GRC.com, well-known uh God, you know, I could hacker, programmer, um, guy who uh, creates the ultimate spin right is the ultimate hard drive utility. I mean, just on and on and on. He's a really great guy to know. He's a good friend, but also a real expert in these things. And what I love about Steve is he's the explainer in chief. He'll he'll take something and make it accessible to us all. Steve, good to see you again. Great to be back. Episode three hundred and forty-seven, uh, and I think all of our iOS Apple device. Listeners are going to be extra interested because we certainly have a, a profile of an audience that's interested in security. Um, a a well-known forensics company, Elcomsoft, who sells cracking technology to law enforcement, um, have done an analysis of about 13 of the most popular password managers which are available. You know, there's tons of password managers for iOS devices, for iPhones and iPads. Um, and the question, of course, is what's going on inside these? Do they actually provide some protection? And the the news is uh, not so much, uh -oh. not in every case, at least. There are, I mean, it's almost comical what some of them do, some of the mistakes they make. So, So rather than just Using that broader brush, we're going to, because we have the information, quickly poke into many of the most common password managers and look inside their technology. We've laid down enough foundation to understand the terms, and we'll see how these things are being used and what protections or, or non-protections they provide. So I, I d gave the podcast the title, iOS Password Mismanagers. Oh, boy. Because some of it's a little frightening. Though there'll, there'll be some people changing their password manager uh, shortly after listening to this podcast. I think. Can I do a little coffee talk? <laughs> oh, 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 absolutely. <laughs> so uh, Steve and I have been going back and forth on v various ways to make coffee, and the latest discovery that I've been uh, exploring is cold brewed coffee. Steve already has decided after buying the uh, um, what was that thing that you bought? The toddy. That you don't li you like the little bite in your coffee. You like the acidity oh. that hot brew coffee, and that's the main reason people do cold brew is is uh, low acidity, mm -hmm. and it's a, and it can be a little stronger because uh, cold brew often you steep for twelve or more hours. So I bought I was this was kind of crazy. This was kind of crazy. Uh, I bought a um, two hundred dollar. You saw it, the tower, the Yama. Yeah, and uh, in fact, I'll play like a little a, video so you can it, see it at work. Does it sit on the? It's like it sits on the countertop yeah. and is like it's you two said, feet like tall. several two feet tall. Yeah, here it is. Watch. This is uh, this is it. Question: How do you make eight cups of perfectly brewed 
Acid free coffee? Answer. I'm being a little silly. The Yama. It is a tower. Da, 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 da. It's furniture. This is the first time I've used it. We start with ice water, literally ice water, dripping one drop per second. See how slow? It's that filter to keep it from boring a hole in the. And there's a little round filter that's not really about filtering, but more about keeping it from, uh, you know, distributing it through the grounds. Completely superfluous. Right. And then the grounds uh, slowly, through a ceramic filter, give up their their liqueur into the decanter. Took all night, and um, highly disappointing. <laughs> highly disappointing. Uh, is not only uh, it is it is it is no acidity, but it's also uh, fairly weak. And considering that it took me all night to make, mm. uh, you get eight cups, and you, and it, you know the idea that of the toddy is that it's much stronger, so you can treat it as a concentrate. This isn't a concentrate, so that's basically two cups of coffee uh, that took all night, and it's wow. still it's still weak. So I, unless I'm doing it wrong, I might try some other techniques. But I do like the toddy. I know you didn't like it because it wasn't acidic enough, but I well, think I'm going to stick with the toddy. Yeah, I my my reaction was that it just didn't taste like coffee. Yeah, it, I'm used to you know there being that bite, and that's what some people I like. like it. Yeah, <laughs> they they like the bite. Some people like it that it doesn't have the bite. Um, and yeah. you know I like it both ways. Today I uh, had the most biting coffee you can make. Oh look at you! Look at you sucking it down. I had the most, which was that uh, stove top espresso machine. That uh, you know boils the water and then forces it through the grinds and it's cooking it. The thing is boiling and boiling and boiling. So by the time you have it, it's like it's like coffee syrup, and that was good and very acidic. So there you go, there you go. But I would say to people, uh, you don't need the Yama, but the Toddy is only thirty bucks. And if you're interested in cold brewed, that that actually did a good job. I thought. Well, I would say if for anyone who is acid sensitive right if we're you know if it upsets your stomach it i does. have a the, i have the stomach of a billy goat i <laughs> just i do i can eat anything nothing affects me and so you know i i don't have a problem with the coffee but it's a great solution for someone who wants a lower a lower acid coffee and i i, I steeped my toddy for a day 24 hours and as a result got a nice rich brew and i didn't feel like i had to you know do uh you know eight ounces per per cup of coffee i could just use a couple ounces and it was delicious yeah, and then you can control the strength by by how much you dilute it down yeah. yeah so there is a story that i was very curious about we talked briefly on twit but i thought this is for this is a story for superman aka <laughs> steve gibson and that's the global payments breach yeah now th there's a there's a there's a stage in credit processing credit card processing that I've been aware of for quite a while because I'm a direct user of a a payment processor like this. I have a you know my my e-commerce system at GRC connects to a a back-end payment processor that is nothing that any user ever sees. It's not a retailer. It's sort of like the it's the inner works of of how this all happens and there's well, maybe a dozen of them there are not that many of them in the united states for example and and they're sort of the central hub of the electronic funds transfer system they've got direct connections to visa and so they're sort of the the front end to the actual credit card issuers themselves and they perform all these transactions. So naturally, they're, they're, they're the, a pot of gold for somebody who wants to perform um, bad acts to acquire credit card information. Now, interestingly, our good friend Brian Krebs broke the story. He picked up on it. He was able to verify it. Um, he was tweeting gleefully last week about he had more site traffic for his blog than he had ever had in history and uh, like the day afterwards because you know these things are very peaky in their response there's always something else happening the day after he tweeted oh only 190,000 views today <laughs> oh sorry Brian but boy so so he was on top of it uh he was in the center um and um, and quoting from his blog, which was the 
authoritative location for all of this information. Um, Wall Street Journal picked up on it later. The, the, the Gartner Group picked up on it. I mean, it was, as you said, it was a big story. He said, it's not clear how many cards were breached. I, I should mention that the reports were upwards of, a, of hundreds of thousands potentially had escaped. So Brian said, it's not clear how many cards were breached in the processor, the, 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 the credit processor attack. But a sampling from one corner of the industry provides some perspective. On Wednesday, PSCU, a provider of online financial services to credit unions, said it had alerted 482 credit unions that appear to have had cards impacted by the breach and that a total of 56,455 member Visa and MasterCard accounts were compromised. PSCU said fraudulent activity had been detected on a relatively small number of those 56,000 plus cards, specifically 876 accounts, and that the activity was geographically dispersed. So it makes sense, first of all, that 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 bad guys who acquired these the, this information, and this is this is everything required to process. This is username, address, zip code, the aye, uh, aye, aye. The, the CVV2 code, you know, the CSV. It's known by various names. That the little three or four digit code right. on the back. Right. You know, it's ev- all of that had to be provided to the and like like street address uh and zip code which are things that are matched all of that was provided to the credit processor and now we know that they are archiving that they're storing it statically um and and that escaped so naturally this is very time sensitive um you know these cards are being shut down. They're being replaced. There, you know, there's certainly a lot of scurrying going on, which means that there's a a rapidly closing window of opportunity for exploitation of this of this stolen data. Um, the good news is that this global payments company reacted responsibly. Um, although we did hear that this was early in March, so you know, it's been. It's been four weeks. Now, I'm looking at the press release from uh, Global Payments. They're saying as many as a million and a half cards were, quote, <laughs> exported. I, I did see that at one point. And Visa know. has dropped support for them. Mm. It may be one of those things where it's maybe wow. worse than we thought. They, they're, By the way, yeah. they... Their stock price dropped four bucks, ten yeah, percent. Yeah, not, was it yeah, about nine or ten percent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm surprised it was that little. Yeah, so you know, we at you know we from this position of scrutinizing security have seen things like this often. I mean, that's that's what the podcast is about is is how this happens and why and what we can do to prevent it, both on an, an individual personal level and on a on, on a major provider level like this. I expect we'll have more news trickling out over time. I imagine Brian will be staying on top of it, and and I'll keep on you know an eye on his blog to see if he if he mentions more. Um, you know, was it the, this their fault? Was this a, a you know employee mistake? Was this miscommunication of their their stuff? I mean, that is a big breach for 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 a million and a half cards to escape. Is I mean, like all the information required to process that number of cards. That's that's big and bad. My my sense is, it can happen to anyone. Unfortunately, um, it it should happen to no one. But we do see it happening. So I wonder if this will be a permanent. If this is a suspension, or you know, if Visa is saying no more. I mean, certainly, this this hurts them because they've got to go out and replace all of those cards and boy, clean up the you know any fraudulent activity across. <laughs> across a huge swath of cards, it's just uh, yeah, it's ugly. They said Visa says we're we're done, but um, wow. So, but from the point of view of a user, 
even if your credit card's breached, the, the, the law says that you don't have you don't owe anything, right? I mean, the credit card you're not liable for fraudulent charges on your account. And in Visa's own statements about this, because they were out there rapidly trying to you know calm people down and and not cause anyone to have any worry, they reiterated exactly that that they that the users of credit cards are completely indemnified against fraudulent use of their card. Um, I mean, I've. I've had no I've had much many fewer problems in the last few years but it used to be that that when I would be flying up to northern california to visit my family for the holidays I'd contact my travel agent and she'd say oh steve uh did your card get compromised again this year and you know cuz she'd need a new credit card <laughs> again <I mean. laughs> this year <laughs> again um and I'd say no believe it or not judy I've still got the same card it's a miracle because, I mean, it just used to be happening. I was, right. you know, this is before I was able to funnel so much through PayPal, and that's been a real boon, or through, you know, Google's uh, shopping service. I, I I work hard not to give the card away, the, the card number, not to disclose it if possible. But again, it's it's the case that not everyone is being careful with it. But as you said, Leo, in no, in no case have I ever you know had any problem just having those chart car- those charges reversed which of course is the argument that the credit card companies make for charging such high interest and they say well you know we have to stay profitable and we're gonna we're indemnifying yeah, we everybody lose. so yeah and that's the point you may not it may not feel like you lose any money but in fact you you're we're all paying for it it's dribbling out yeah. every month and so you have balances but i have to say uh all the card companies are much more proactive about calling about fraudulent charges um I yep. I've talked about this on Twitter. I had an order with shoes.com. It was my first order. I used a credit card uh, and had it shipped to a different address than the billing address. And mm-hmm. shoes.com called me. And when they couldn't reach me, they canceled the order. And I think that more and more, uh, you know, you're, that's what you're going to see. Shoes, because I ordered athletic shoes, That is, those are apparently a, a red flag. Dvorak says that <laughs> you can get any credit card canceled by doing this. In the same day, filling up two different tanks of ga- with gas and buying athletic shoes, they will cancel your card. He says, I'll just cancel your card because that's such a pattern for somebody who has a stolen credit card. He's going to fill himself up and his friends and then go out and buy some sneakers. <laughs> they just no, I don't know if that's true, but it's a great story. <laughs> Actually, I think that's very clever. The multiple fill ups with a single right. card. That doesn't sound that's right. That's clever. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I have one card. That I my main card actually I cannot buy gas with it. They every time I did, then I'd you know I'd be at a restaurant and they'd say I'm sorry sir your car yeah. is not. It's like oh, what you know and then I'd call them and I'd say oh, well you know you you used it at a gas pump and I finally after several times this happened I said look can you just turn that part off of my fraud protection? She said no sir we're not we're unable to do that, and she explained that the advantage to a bad guy is that they're next to their car right if they need to make they a getaway run. they can run yes <laughs> and they're at an audit they're at an automated terminal where you know all it can do is say yay or nay right and so it's a way for them to test the card to see if it still works wow so although increasingly i mean I, now i have to put my zip code in every time that i use the card and so it's you yeah. know, they, they would have to have that to go along with it. We're seeing more, and that's exactly why. We're seeing more and more uh, fraud protection uh, techniques. And, uh, you know, it, it shows you it's not that hard to do. But two, but two Phillips, that's brilliant. Yeah. You know, because who's yeah. going to do that? That's unusual, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So another piece of news just hit. Uh, Ars Technica reported something that I kind of thought we everyone assumed, but I got so many tweets about it that I thought, well, maybe not. And that is that Apple holds the master key to the iCloud. And a a careful reading of the iCloud terms and conditions um, says things like Apple can pre-screen, move, refuse, modify, and or remove content at any time. If the content is deemed, quote, objectionable, unquote, or otherwise in violation of terms of service. Furthermore, Apple can, quote, access, use, preserve, and or disclose your account information and content to law enforcement authorities, unquote, whenever required or permitted by law. Apple further says 
that it will review content reportedly in violation of copyright under our favorite DMCA. Violation statute. of copyright? <gasps> mm-hmm. Now, see, I could see on court order, a subpoena, on violation of copyright. Oh, that well, pisses so, me off. Yeah, the takeaway from this is that that if you use iCloud, it's super convenient. It's all synchronized in the cloud and all that. Yeah. But it is it's encrypted in transit, and then it's encrypted by Apple when it's at rest. When your data is at rest, it's under Apple's encryption, not yours. Yep. So they can poke in there, peek in there, do whatever they want to, whenever. Um, I want to talk about, and I'm going to, I think, tentatively in two weeks, if nothing else comes up, about an interesting sort of very security conscious cloud-based service. Um, his name escapes me at the moment. I wrote it down. And I, I've been on my radar for a couple of months, and I've been meaning to get to it. And I thought, since this was this had made so much news with you know people being upset by this idea, it's like, well, let's take a look because we've often talked about pre-internet encryption. You, you know, if if you can if you encrypt something, a blob, then iCloud syncs it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's fine because all they ever get is pseudo random a blob mm-hmm. of pseudo random mm-hmm. noise. They can't. They have no visibility into it. But if it's just being done by your devices, it's safe in transit, but then it's, you know, it's under Apple's lock and key once it's there. So no I, privacy. I didn't, yeah, I didn't assume anyone would think otherwise, but I thought it was worth pointing out that this is, you know, you get the convenience, but you're not doing device level encryption for, you know, I, I don't know if some of the services they're offering might require them to have visibility but in any event they do and that's sort of you know part of what you get i think for from using a big bulk you know public service like like apple well and that's something i talk about with carbonite who's one of our sponsors is that in fact i remember having the conversation with the ceo of carbonite he says we get subpoenas all the time we just say sorry can't help you because they do pre-internet encryption they support you know encryption and you keep the key right and of course famously dropbox wasn't doing dropbox still doesn't Yep. And yep. I, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, there you go. It's one thing to say, look, we'll comply with a court order from, you know, law enforcement. It's another thing entirely to say, oh, and by the way, if the record industry asks, we'll give we'll, we'll hand you over. That's right. To me, that's another thing entirely. So um, we were right in our pretty much of tossing we <laughs> off without much thought that claim that we discussed last week about this XRY's company video. Remember, they showed a video which claimed to allow them to hack a a password-protected or passcode-protected iPhone instantly in a matter of seconds. And, and, you know, we both talked about how, you know, and they, it showed them holding the button down while they powered it on. And when we realized that was about, you know, the phone being a RAM disk and, and that Apple had fixed that um, some number of versions ago. And there has since been a bunch of, of public debunking of that video, which, which they have removed from YouTube. Oh, they, they've, taken the video, they've taken the video down. Now, um, people that have looked at it closely verify, you know, confirmed what we believed. But We'll be coming back to this later in the podcast, but it's it's worth talking about um, what can be done and what what cannot be done. What is what has happened is that as we mentioned, the iOS security and the device, the physical device security, has been improved dramatically over time. And as I've I've had to look at what iOS is doing and and the devices are doing much more carefully for this podcast. And I have to say I'm impressed with what Apple has done. That is, the very first iPhone offered just UI protection. All you know was there was no encryption of the device. It was it was just, you know, the the passcode you put in sort of just kept you from getting past the, the lock screen. But there was, you know, nothing else going on. And 
the forensic companies were having a field day with that because naturally a, a phone is a wealth of information for law enforcement. They, they would love to have access to everything in someone's phone. And so as the iPhone has become increasingly popular, as we've moved from version 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, now we're at 5.0.1, I think is the, the latest. Um, Apple has really taken measures to increase the strength. There are, for example, they, they, have, they have added full file system encryption, although there are a couple little catches. For example, if you never, if you were on iOS 3 and you never wiped the device and then reinstalled under iOS 4 or 5, if you simply updated iOS itself to 4 or 5, then you still don't have an encrypted file system which some people may not be aware of. It turns out the, the encrypted file system is super important. I mean, it's, it's really it's, it's what everyone should have and want because it's zero hassle. Apple manages it beautifully, and uh, it really does protect users. I feel like and I then, take a performance. You're talking about File Vault, their built-in File Vault, yes? Yes. I feel like I take a performance hit with that. Well, not, now, not File Vault, but the actual, I mean, the entire device... Oh, I, I mean, see. The, okay. Yeah, the whole that kind of like you know, Intel's TPM thing, where it's just it's just built in. Then it's done. What it's done by the CPU in and automatically using its own. Yeah, there there is hardware hardware crypto now yeah. in the latest devices, and and uh, and 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 the forensics companies are not happy. The iPhone 4s <laughs> and iPad 2. They've, they, it's really been locked so down. So it's, it's automatic. There's nothing like... It's not like... Okay, I understand. File Vault's on the desktop. This is automatic on the, on the iOS stuff. There's nothing you can do yep. about it. I got exactly. It. I got it. Yeah. And for, so, so, for example, um, one of the things that they're doing, we'll be talking about key strengthening because, because there's two places that users will get security. And, and, and this is really where this, this XRY company was misleading people. Because the, the, even if you have access to the device, what Apple has done is they, they've used very good key strengthening or key stretching. The, the acronym is, is, is a tongue twister. It's PBKDF2, which stands for Password-Based Key Derivation Function Version 2. And I've seen people say, well, you can remember that by peanut butter keeps dogs friendly, too. That's the same acronym. Um, so w what they do is, uh, and, and we've talked about this PBKDF2 before, because, for example, WPA, the WPA2 encryption, the, the good, strong encryption, what, what it does is it takes the user's passphrase and the SSID and essentially hashes it with some salt 4,096 times. It does it 4,096 times, in, essentially in a loop, taking the output from the first one, putting it into the second one, hashing that, putting that into the third one, hashing that into the fourth one, hashing that, so forth. Because it just makes it computationally infeasible I mean, it, it's like it slows down any guessing that you do by by the factor of how long it takes to perform that operation. So um, uh, Apple does this 10,000 times on their iOS devices. So, so even if you have a, some, some access to the phone, talking about this XRY video, for example... Even if they had access to the phone, the, because of the fact that anything you put in has to run through 10,000 of this, these complex hashing functions in order to get the key, which you can then test to see if it will decrypt the phone, the best you can do – oh, and it has to be done on the phone. You can, this is not an offline attack. So the phone itself, because it also uses some non 
public key as part of this this password strengthening you the phone itself has to do it so you can't use gpus or anything else you've got to you have to do it on the on the particular device that you're trying to crack because the point is if you put the same say you just did a four digit passcode you put the same four digit passcode into a different phone it comes out of this strengthening function with a completely different 256 bit key so because every phone is different because every phone has its own secret keys that it never it never publishes i mean i'm very impressed with the technology that apple has they've done a good job the point is it takes about a quarter second meaning you can only do four 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 digit passcodes per second now that's not super strong security because it means if you just do the math that it takes about 42 minutes to try 0000 to 9999. So one of our takeaways from this analysis today is you really do want to use, if you're relying on this Apple security, you want to use a stronger passcode because 42 minutes is not very long. Bob, but remember that, that you also have this feature that if they try 10 times and fail, it erases everything. No, this is, well, I mean, yes, if you use the UI, oh. not, if, not if you're attached to the phone oh. forensically. So it's not, it's not paying attention to the count forensic. Correct. Oh, interesting, huh? Correct. But so, so, so that's one takeaway. So we'll, we'll come back to this a little bit later because what we're going to see is that many of these password managers provide virtually no additional protection. So you really I mean, want the OS protection? To be tip yes, top. and then and we need to talk about backup or encryption also mm-hmm. because you know docking our devices to our machines. It turns out that that using a really strong backup password is is equally important because that's another place where the entire phone set of data is sitting and is available for forensics. And you know the the law enforcement might often have a good reason for getting it from bad guys. But you know we want them. We want we want to control it ourselves. Um, I got a, a great tweet this morning from uh, Andrew Mason, who's in London. Tweeted from uh, at a Mason, who told me about a site I hadn't seen. Are we slim yet? dot com. <laughs> And this is not about body weight. Okay, because I know the answer. I don't really have to check a website for that. <laughs> yeah, you, Leo, you stand on your keyboard. <laughs> and oh, um, so areweslimyet.com is Mozilla's self-monitoring of Firefox's memory consumption. Oh, how clever. Over time. How clever. Now you have to be yeah. using Firefox. Do you have to go to that site uh, in Firefox? I don't think so. I did because I'm I'm still I'm 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 still See, very I'm, happy. I'm, I'm on Safari here, and I'm getting okay. information. So yeah, I, I I don't think you need to use Firefox. You yeah, you have to have scripting because they're they're very script. It's like a whole bunch of you you can like zoom in on these charts and things uh, by by moving your mouse around and then then clicking. But here is this areweslimyet.com shows over the history of Firefox versions, how they're using memory and and graphically demonstrates their their determination to just fight that down. And you know, I'm I'm I love all of I love the, the the tabs on the side and my tools I have in Firefox. I'm now that I'm at eleven and they really did they did solve the memory bloat problem. You know, where sometimes I'd I'd wake the machine up after it was on overnight, and it been used it used up all my three gigs. It's like, now, oh, okay, is this information from my machine or their own stuff? This is their own forensics Got over it. time. Got it. So, so these are static. Just it's sort not of my just number. For us to, yeah. Right. Right. I get it. I was saying, how do they know? <laughs> how do they know? All right. So it um, is. They're I getting. Don't... They're getting slimmer, aren't they? Yeah, they're doing it. I'm. I'm. I'm impressed. Especially with and tabs now closed. Now that we're not sure how much we love Google, I thought, well, that's good. I'm, I'm happy I love Firefox. Um, on April 1st, uh, and I was conscious of the fact that it was April 1st, was the news that Ashton Kutcher, 
Kutcher? Kutcher? Kutcher. Kutcher. Uh, now I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say Kutcher. Kutcher. Oh, Kutcher. forget it. Who cares? Anyway. Who cares? Anyway, uh, well, we might care. He's been uh, chosen to play Steve Jobs. Yeah, but just in some indie flick. In the well, I know, it's but not, there's uh, a big biopic from Sony coming up. Actually, this is good, better news than you think. Okay, so he's been picked because he has a stringy beard and stringy hair, and he looks like the young Steve Jobs. He actually does. I had never really. Put yeah, it but together, anybody but... with a stringy beard and stringy hair would okay. look that way. Okay, and it's in a indie pick, which means he won't be able to play it in the really big one based on the Isaacson biography when Sony does that. Thank God. Uh, uh, I'm not an okay. Ashton Kutcher fan. As you might det determine. I think you just pronounced his name correctly. Too. I think I did. As soon as I was angry about it. <laughs> Are you excited that he's going to play? I mean, he does look like, he does look the part. And he's a good actor. Yeah, it's I've... not that he's not a good actor. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I have no bias one way or the other. I don't like him or dislike him. I, you know, I'm maybe a little jealous of him, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm very that's... jealous of him. No, he's not, de he's not dating Demi Moore anymore, though. So that's. Um, oh, okay. Well. Yeah, so you're not, you don't have to be jealous about that. He seemed to be a good guy. He, he and yeah, Bruce he and Demi were all getting along. And <laughs> so the, interest, the interesting thing, I don't know how we got in this Hollywood uh, gossip thing, but the interesting thing, and I, we, <laughs> I talked, we did an interview with Dana Brunetti, who's an old friend. He's a, a Hollywood producer. I'm he produced The Social Network, and they tried Trigger Street, his production company, with Kevin Spacey. They tried very hard to get the Walter Isaacs bi Isaacson biography, but lost out to Sony. Ah. But he, uh, in the process, was spending a lot of time thinking about, well, who do you get to play Jobs? And the real problem is the age range. Because Kutcher can play the young Jobs, but he can't play Good the point. later Jobs. Right. <clears throat> so it's a, actually a very tricky casting decision. I'm sure that this pick will be mostly about the young Steve Jobs, the hip Steve Jobs. Well, he was always. Yeah, you think so? Because I mean, he was. It was the later Steve Jobs that changed the world. Right. I mean, but that you know, picture phase, of Kutcher is of, of comparing him to a twenty-three-year-old Steve Jobs. Yeah. So how do you? Somebody was suggesting Tom Cruise. I don't know if that's a good pick either, though. Oh, please no. <laughs> Fortunately, it's not our decision. <laughs> well, it'll be fun that we're going to get some movies. Oh yeah, so. we're going to get lots of movies. Are you kidding? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So I did poke just briefly to, to talk about health. I poked a little bit into this Dave Agus, whose book, The End of Illness, you mentioned last week. Yeah. What'd you think? And I, well, I was a little put off because I went to his website and he has a video on there where he's talking about how supplements are harmful. Hmm. And he quoted, he said, he quoted a very bad vitamin E study. Oh, dear. Well, first of all, it, yeah. Anyone who just says vitamin E, Immediately, I'm worried because there isn't anything called vitamin E. There's eight vitamin E's. Mm. There's alpha, beta, gamma, and delta tocopherol and alpha, beta, gamma, delta tocotrienol. There's, there's a family of eight. And unfortunately, because early nutrition scientists saw that, that alpha tocopherol seemed to be what there was most of, that's what all the supplements have. Right. And, and that's what you'll see if you look at your yep. bottle of, yep. on a multivitamin, it's alpha to cope for all. Mm -hmm. Well, what was found was that in people taking huge amounts of alpha to cope for all, there seemed to be a correlation with an increase in prostate cancer. Mm. Thus, unfortunately, David says supplements are harmful. Mm. Now, and vitamin E causes prostate cancer. The fact is, ill-advised, uninformed use over consumption of one of the eight vitamin E's does. Gamma tocope for all turns out to be the one that we need. And because the molecules are so similar, if you overload on alpha, it competes with the other tocope for alls and tocotrienols and keeps them from having the effect that they should. So what you want is a vitamin E which is full spectrum, that, it c that contains all eight of the different types in the same ratio that they occur in nature. And, you know, that's the E that I take and have been taking. And if you do that, then you're fine. And then, of course, the other problem is, arguably, almost everyone needs to supplement their vitamin D. That's, that is, you know, it's been the, our own 
purely anecdotal experience with the, the, the podcast I did where I got flooded with people after the holiday season saying, hey, this is the first season I never got sick, you know, probably thanks to vitamin D. I mean, the, and, and since then, it's been several years since we did that, you know, there's, we're, there's this constant reports about the, the benefits of, of vitamin D supplementation. So anyway, the guy seemed like a little bit of a populist and like, you know, Read the me, book because I think me. that what you see on the website is a, um, you know, summary. Uh, he's he may not say uh, don't take multivitamins. He, you know, he has some interesting. I think his his the larger story is still accurate, which is which that was. we don't we don't treat people as systems uh, because we've had such success using antibiotics to target a particular illness or antivirals to target a particular illness, we have changed our model of medicine from thinking of it as a systemic model at, to a, a, you know, you've got an invader, aim a weapon at them. And now he's an oncologist, a cancer doctor, and he says that that doesn't work because cancer is a systemic issue. And mm. that many of the illnesses we see come from s- systemic issues and that we've kind of gotten away from that in medicine because we've had such success with the magic bullets. So yep. it's a, I think that's true. And I think that's probably what he means when he's talking about supplements, that you can't treat them as a magic bullet. You have to think systemically. One of the things he does recommend is a lot getting blood work on a regular basis, looking. He says everybody's individual. You need to look at what these things are doing. And so I think in that regard, he probably does say, you know, supplement your vitamin D if if you need vitamin D I think what he's against is just kind of take vitamins because it's good for you attitude right so I do however have a book recommendation oh good I'm at the end of this book I am so impressed by this book um, it's funny too because as I was reading it um, this, and this is the one I've mentioned a couple times that it was about nutritional anthropology essentially um, I was thinking, wow, I hate the title of this book because it's just not serious enough. <laughs> and I was telling people, in fact, I may have mentioned it to you on the podcast, that I am I would imagine that when this book was first written, the author, whose name is Jeff Bond, actually his middle name is James, so oh. Jeff, Jeff James Bond, he, he is from the UK, uh, but it's G-E-O-F-F mm. um, Bond. I could imagine that he, when he submitted his galleys to the publisher... It was probably titled Nutritional Anthropology right. or Applied Practical Tr- Nutritional Anthropology or something. And the publisher said, yeah, huh? Yeah, well, we'll never sell it if that's what we call it. Um, what's funny is that I this is his second book. And and I did find his first book, which is titled Natural Eating. And then the subtitle is Nutritional Anthropology, <laughs> Eating in Harmony with Our Genetic Programming. Oh, see, this is the new thing so, everybody's talking about. Well, and and frankly, I'm now self-conscious about ever having mentioned Gary Tobbs because I ran across a, a quote from him about what he eats. And it's like, oh, boy, you know, that's <laughs> nothing that I'm able to endorse from all the research I've done. Um, anyway, the book is unfortunately titled Deadly Harvest. Oh, dear. Which which is, I know, which is meant to sell copies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But, you know, it is a serious piece of work. He and his wife have lived among uh, Aboriginal tribes and eaten what they eat. It is massively referenced in research. The last third of the book is is the is the references to everything he refers to through the book for people who haven't studied as i have things like evolutionary psychology there's a whole chunk about you know like pressures that that like more than just eating like like uh, societal and and familial relationships and interpersonal relationships and how our past formed you know who we are today anyway i it's been a a fantastic read. Um, I I recommend it without reservation for anyone who is who's curious about uh, sort of where I've gone with my with my reading. Deadly Harvest by Jeff G E O F F Bond. I've I've ordered uh, it, was, it. Yeah, it was all good. And I I've, I've been reading a book, similar book called The New Evolution Diet by this guy Arthur Devaney, who's an economist, 
but similar uh, nutritional anthropology. I presume that you know all of this stuff is around the same idea, which is that we stopped evolving about forty thousand years ago, and we should eat uh, as our and and exercise. In this case, uh, he talks a lot about exercise. As yeah, our, you know as the our way the way ancestors I, did. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the way I would sum it up is that we evolved in a world of scarcity right you know meat was scarce it was you know it ran away so it was it wasn't staying put for us to to get it um sweet stuff was scarce you know like the only real source of sweets was uh, was honey in african killer bee nests and you know they tended to protect their honey too and so so we we wanted things that were high calorie but we couldn't get them you know i mean they were scarce so we largely s- supported ourselves eating a, a lower calorie, which is to say plant-based and slow-moving animal, you know, like crickets and locusts and slugs and snails and things. Um, that was our diet. Now, but we were built to want the higher calorie foods. Now, so what happened, of course, in, in summary is we got very smart with agriculture and with with industrialization and with with farming and so today we have all this technology that lets us have anything we want and unfortunately we're still programmed as we once were for you know to want high calorie things and now we can have all the meat we can imagine we can have all of the grain which didn't exist back then and and all of the you know refined sugar 60 minutes as a matter of fact did a piece that was really interesting just this last sunday on raising the question is sugar toxic and i'm convinced it is and what they weren't quite ready to go into yet in is so is white bread you know so is grain because it converts immediately into sugar and has almost all of the same effects. So, you know, those were things that we just weren't designed to handle. Our bodies weren't designed to handle them. And, you know, you look around at, at what's happening to us as a consequence. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're smart. And unfortunately, we're, we're able to now give ourselves anything we could imagine we want and not, 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 not necessarily good for us. But something is good for us. Yes. And that's spin right. Yes. Uh, I got How on I know? March, <laughs> March th- How did you guess? How did I know? On March 30th, um, I, uh, I got a nice note from a Greg Dilly. I think that's how I pronounce his name, D-I-L-L-E. Uh, the subject was Process Control Site License slash Spinrite. And he said, Steve, just wanted to let you know I work at a major chemical plant refinery. Check your recent purchases of four copies to match it up. We bought a copy of Spinrite, one copy, a while back and have been using it quite successfully in our process control environment. Shortly after purchase, I sent a note to our group stating that we should acquire a site license, but the powers that be did not take me seriously. I've tried to advocate the use of Spinrite out here whenever I felt the situation warranted it, as we have some nodes that are really old and there is no plan to replace them. They're working, so... Why fix them? During this year's software license true up, which I thought was interesting, it must be like where they decided to, you know, get themselves current. Yeah. I brought it up again, and others have since realized the value of Spinrite. So we just made the effort to purchase four copies so that we would have a site license. Thanks for all you do, Greg. Yeah. And that's, you know, thank you, Greg. I really do appreciate that. Yay. You know, it's an honor system, but uh, that's what keeps us. That's what keeps us going. We're going to uh, take a break, then we'll come back and talk about password mismanagement on iOS and find out which ones to use and not to use, and how to secure <laughs> iOS. And I'm sitting here ready with my iPad and iPhone to take your uh, advice. Before we do, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about my friends at Ford. Uh, and you know, it's nice because one of the reasons Ford advertises on this show and uh, many of our other Twitch shows is because they know they're talking to intelligent geeks who will understand things like Ford has an, a software API and SDK for sync, whereas you couldn't really put that on the Super Bowl. So what, 
they want you to understand what AppLink is all about. It's really, really cool. When I first heard about AppLink, I, I said, oh, my gosh. This was, I think, a couple of years ago. We've talked a lot about Ford Sync. Um, I became familiar with it uh, in my 2010 uh, Mustang, which I still drive and love. Uh, the whole idea of Sync is that with all the research Ford has done, uh, they've come uh, to the clear realization that we are good drivers. We are good at drivers as long as we're paying attention with our hands on the wheel and the eyes on the road. Where we get in trouble, where we distracted driving is an issue, is where our hands are on a, on a, um, a, a phone or on a console or our eyes are no longer on the road. We look down, even briefly, hugely dangerous. Uh, every accident I've been in the last few years is because, because, been because somebody, not me, wasn't looking. They were on the phone. They were diddling with the dial. And uh, that's the danger. So that's what Sync is all about. And that's just clever. I, I think what, what, what they said at Ford was, I'm sure this was what Alan Mulally told his team, look, we, we want to keep people's hands on the wheel. We want to keep people's eyes on the road. But people want to be connected to the outside world. They want to control their systems in the car. How can we do that? And, of course, voice is the obvious answer. And that's what Sync is all about. You're driving along, you press the button on the steering wheel, and you can talk to the car. You could set the cabin temperature. You can uh, do navigation. You know, as with all cars, it locks out the navigation screen when you're driving. But your voice, you can still say destination. And it goes, yes, where do you have to go? And you can tell it the destination, the street address or the POI name. And it will guide you there all without looking it down. And I love that. The voice instructions, the whole thing. Uh, sports scores, horoscopes. I mean, it goes on and on. And now with this app link... They've made it possible for people who are writing software for smartphones, Android and iPhone and, and Windows Phone, to interface with the car. Uh, AppLink is an API, an application. Uh, they've got an application developer network that will work with developers. They can contact Ford about their app ideas, and Ford will support them in getting them to market. And uh, yeah, I think you're starting to see this. We mentioned that they've got Pandora. That's so cool. So basically, Pandora's on your phone. Your phone is connected via Bluetooth or directly. You can use USB or Bluetooth to connect to the sync. Now you can talk to the phone. You could say Pandora, PlayStation, uh, Rolling Stones, thumbs up, thumbs down, next. Um, you know, all of the commands in Pandora are available via sync, via voice. Stitcher will uh, let you listen to shows like this. Open Beak will let you listen to tweets. Slacker Radio, another great podcast client. They've added iHeartRadio, which is fantastic. You've got Sync Destinations. This is a new app that lets you access navigation and directions through the phone. So it gives you another form of navigation available. Uh, NPR is there, giving you breaking news. You can play your uh, favorite NPR programs. The Our Heart Radio supports their Thumbplay service. I like the name of it, Thumbplay, which gives you uh, simple voice commands to find saved stations. You can literally say, "I want you know, it's time to listen to the tech guy. Play KFI. And it will open up, and there's my show. Uh, you can skip to uh, the next song if you're listening to their radio. Uh, give a song a thumbs up. Sync App Link. It's built on an API platform which lets Ford and app developers bring in vehicle voice control to apps in your phone without having you to up. You don't have to update anything in the car. It just happens magically. You can expect to see more Sync-enabled mobile apps that can go along for the ride in Ford vehicles. Best thing to do. Go to a Ford dealer and drive one today and I say specifically, hey, I want a Ford with the app link. I want to take a look at that. Or go to Ford.com slash technology and take a look at the website there and all the information, including the app link. There's a whole article about it. And if you're a developer, contact Ford to find out more about app link and how to get your app working. What a great idea. Ford.com slash technology. We thank Ford for their support of Security now. They wanted to reach the geeks. They know where to go. <laughs> Steve's got them. Ah, yes. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about uh, iOS. I use LastPass on iOS. I hope that's still safe. They've done a good job. You know, I did vet them extensively. There's it, what seems to be the case is that I I can't quite understand the thinking on the password manager developers part of not making them as strong as they can. It, it appears that in some cases they just don't care. 
It's a, it's a free app, for example. Many of them are free. And they've just sort of said, well, some people are going to buy them. You know, people who don't know any better will buy them. And so it doesn't really matter. It's like, okay. I mean, certainly a takeaway, as by the time I'm through enumerating the specifics, our listeners are going to know and understand clearly that it's not enough for the thing just to say, oh, we, you know, you have to put a password in to get to your passwords um, and we're going to protect them from you. It's like, well, okay. I mean, we really do need to know the details. Now, this, but this all starts from the sort of the forensic attack angle. The idea being, of course, that, that somebody presumably um, law enforcement some, or, or a hacker who's got access to the same sorts of tools is trying to get to your stuff. Um, this Elkomsoft is one of the leading suppliers of forensic tools. Um, th- on their page, it's elcomsoft.com. On their page, they talk about, they say, enhanced forensic access to iPhone, iPad, iPod devices running Apple iOS. And then under, they say, perform the complete forensic acquisition of user data stored in iPhone, iPad, iPod devices running any version of iOS. Elcomsoft iOS Forensic Toolkit allows eligible customers acquiring bit-to-bit images of devices' file systems extracting device secrets, passcodes, passwords, and encryption keys, and decrypting the file system image. Access to most information is provided instantly. And um, it goes on to enumerate features and benefits all in one complete solution, uh, quick file system acquisition, 20 to 40 minutes for 32 gig models, zero footprint operation leaves no traces or alterations, and so forth. So this is something which which is used to to access the innards of these phones. Now they they published a paper which which explains sort of the background of of the environment that they're trying to operate in. And one of the things that they make very clear is that the they look at iOS and BlackBerry. Um, there's no coverage here uh, in their paper of, of Android devices. I'll keep my eyes out for anything that gets published like that so we can talk about that when, when something exists. Um, but as I was mentioning at the, uh, earlier, it is the case that Apple has gone to great lengths and very, I think very impressive lengths to provide security to the users. Now, as we also mentioned in another context earlier, as soon as you synchronize with iCloud, that's out the window because Apple holds the encryption and you don't. But if you, if you as long as you don't do that, we, we, we don't know for sure whether Apple holds the keys per phone. Each iOS device, iPhone, iPad, iPod, has unique hardware encryption keys and those are used as part of the unlocking process to develop the, when when you actually enter this little passcode to unlock your device. You know, to us it seems like, you know, all it's doing is sliding the screen over. It is in fact producing a very strong 256-bit symmetric cipher key and it is only that that allows the file system to be viewed. The file system is stored, given that it is encrypted, as, as long as that's the case, as pseudorandom data. It is completely unavailable unless you have that 256-bit key. And the only way to get it is by running through this process. Now, if you do it through the UI, as you mentioned, Leo... If you, as long as you've got the wipe after ten, miss you know mistakes, you're probably safe. If there is a way to 
to get past that. If if the phone, first of all, if the phone is jailbroken, all bets are off. So you absolutely don't want to jailbreak an I, any of these iOS devices because that, that breaks down the, the fundamental protections that keep people from getting in. It may be the case that there are that there are ways in and that the the forensics companies have a way in but even if they do then then we, they are prevented from trying any more than about four pass codes per second getting you know them getting a way in bypasses that 10 mistakes file system wipe feature um you know, my advice would be always run with that. The, you know, the the downside is if you know if a if a toddler grabbed your phone and was playing with it and made ten mistakes, you'd wipe out your phone. But then you've got your backup. So you know, hopefully, you're docking with iTunes from time to time on a on a base station computer, and it's it's kept synchronized. Or you're using iCloud if you're not that concerned about Apple's having access. And and you're you're um, so you're backed up, you know, very currently that way. Certainly, it makes sense to turn that on. But if there's a way to get to the device underneath this, you know, in a jailbroken style, in a in by somehow hacking to it, then then anyone forensically analyzing it is still going to have to come up with this 256 bit key. And Apple does a 10,000 round password strengthening, which, which has to be done on the device using the device's hardware because it mixes in the device's individual hardware keys as part of that. So that, that puts an absolute limit of about four, per, four tries per second when you have that kind of access. So that says about about an average of 20 minutes to to guess a four digit passcode now to me that says if you really do want security you can't settle for a four digit passcode you need to go to the more complex turn off the simple passcode get yourself a full keyboard and then do whatever you want you know this is really where there's a trade-off between convenience and security because this is something you've got to be able to do every time you turn on, you know, you 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 unblank your device or turn it on. I mean, it's on all the time, actually, but, you know, go to use it. You need to say, hi, it's me, and prove that it's you. But this is where something like password haystacks, the haystacks concept comes in because length here can really trump complexity. Yes, you want Yes, I know nothing's better than pure entropy, but still, you know, you, there's a trade-off with what's easy and feasible to enter. But the bad guy doesn't know anything about your strategy for having padded a password. You know, use the haystacks approach. So what you want is something long, but also something you won't go crazy having to type in all the time. Well, so, and that's kind of the issue on iOS. It's one of the reasons people like those four digits is I can, you know, I'm doing this on a phone anyway with my thumb, and I want to do it quickly. Yep. And so, uh, yep. yes, you can have a long password, but who wants to sit there every time you turn on the phone and tap, 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 right. tap. So, so all, I'm, all I want to do here is, like, explain what the trade-off is, right, right. Which, which, is, which is if it's digits only, that well, you know, I mean, actually, you can do the math. You could you you could go to grc.com slash haystack, and it'll do the math for you of using different alphabet complexities and different lengths, and then you can figure that there will be four attempts per second. Which I mean, is that is slow? The Apple's done a nice job of making it that slow because. You know, that's no G, stick it on a GPU and do, you know, a billion per second. That's four per second, which is pretty slow. And somebody has to have your phone for that length of time. But if you just make it six digits and a bigger alphabet, then it goes quickly to years to, to, to crack it. And, you know, I think uh, there was like a six digits with a full alphabet. I did some math. I think it was like 88 years. It's like, okay, that's probably enough. You know, to 
you know, on average to, to crack something. And six, six characters isn't that hard to type. So, um, so, so that's where that trade-off is. But that's getting into the device. Now, what it turns out is that, that once in, many, well, for, first of all, some users might not be locking their phone at all or their iPad. They may just want to access it. They, they, they figure, hey, I, there's nothing I'm storing here that I care about except my passwords. Hmm. For, and so the idea being that people want the convenience of turning the phone on and just having it right now, right now access. But they go, hey, I've got a password manager that I have either free or purchased because both types are available. And that's where I'm going to put the responsibility for keeping the things that I really care about. I'm going to lock them up in with under a password manager and... But otherwise, who cares about my contacts and my, you know, web browsing history and things? You know, I'm not doing anything on the phone that I don't, I don't mind if somebody looks at. So the question is, how secure are the password managers? So oh, I, I need to also mention the backup before I move on. The other one access point that the forensics guys have is the physical phone. The other is the backup. Now, again, I was impressed when I learned that Apple encrypts the backup before it leaves the phone using the phone's keys. So the, the backup is not encrypted. I just assumed it was encrypted on the PC, the, you know, the Mac or the PC, whatever you're, you're um, synchronizing your, your phone to. It's not the case. It's encrypted by the phone in the phone and only the encrypted result is stored, except that the, the backup password complexity definitely matters because that can be attacked in an, in an offline attack. So, uh, it's, again, Apple's done a good job of making it secure, but if you, if you use encrypted backups and you absolutely definitely want to um i'll wrap this up with some some bullet points of th sort of a checklist of things apple users and to a lesser degree black blackberry users need to do they're pretty much the same but a a really good first of all using backup encryption is important especially as we'll see in a second because the password managers are not many of them are not providing much if any protection and if you do encrypt your backup, you want to use a good, strong, complex password because there an, an offline attack is possible. Okay, so what are the password managers doing? I've separated them into three categories. Brain dead, <laughs> brain challenged, and useful. Um, so, oh, oh, I can think a lot of people <laughs> hoping they don't get in that first category. Okay. <laughs> So under brain dead, there's a there's something that just uh, there's a as a free password manager called safe, uh, safe password. Yeah, and it's also known as awesome password light. Yeah, and also as password lock light, and in this case, heavy on the light. <laughs> uh, nothing is encrypted. All user data is stored in plain text. Oh, for crying out loud. The master password is limited to four digits, and it's stored in plain text. So, so password recovery, such as it is, is instantaneous. <laughs> Not that it matters much, because everything's in the clear anyway. Just couldn't be more ridiculous. So, nothing safe about safe password. Um i secure light is a, a i secure light password manager also no encryption all user data stored in plain text the master password in plain text so so that means those uh, to be clear about what that means uh or I, i'll finish one more ultimate password manager uh their free version uh no encryption all this is the ultimate password manager leo no encryption. All user data stored in plain text. Master password stored in plain text. Okay, so 
What those are doing is nothing. Um, you know, you go to the app and it says, what's your password? Um, well, you type it in and it sees if it matches the plain text copy that it has stored. And if so, it, you know, lowers the drawbridge. It lets you look at your passwords and, and data that you stored in there, which are also stored all in the plain, in plain text. So if, if somebody had access, got access to your phone and could get past its, its lock code, or if your phone is not locked, if you don't use that, then, then anybody can read out all your passwords if you're using any of those first three brain dead ones. Or if you're not encrypting your backup and someone has access to your PC where you have backed up your machine, same story. There's all your passwords just laying out there. You know, I mean, you'd, 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 you'd print the file and there would be all of your data from these password managers. Now, secret there, there's also under, under the brain dead category, the last one is secret folder light, which uh, is the same author as password lock light, which I, where I mentioned that was the first one I talked about heavy on the light. Um, and it's just as light. It protects folders of photo and video files, but the passwords are all in plain text and they can be instantly recovered. So none wow. of those wow. offer any protection. Now, stepping up a little bit, we come to the brain challenged too. There's something called keeper password and data vault. Now, this one uses encryption, AES-128. Most of the things we'll talk about from here on out use encryption, and they most of them use AES-128, sometimes 256. Um, we, we know that 128 is just fine for, for today. Um, it encrypts in CBC mode, cipher block chaining, which is this, a st one of the standard modes for using AES encryption, so that's good. Um, the encryption key uses the first 16 bytes of the, because, um, yeah, the 16 bytes, which is 128 bits, of the SHA-1 hash of the master password. So that's pretty good. You put in any length password you want, it hashes that to 128, to, it does an SHA-1, then it uses the first 128 bits of that as the key for the AES encryption. But the master password is verified by, by comparing an MD5 hash of what you enter with the MD5 hash of the password when you set it. So when you're setting this up, you, you know, it says, Give us your master password, and you enter it. Then it says, oh, verify that, you know, and so you put it in a second time. And it's like, oh, very good. Those, 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 you put it in twice correctly, so we believe you're going to be able to do it in the future. It then makes an MD5 hash of that, and that's what it stores. So the, the crypto is good, but it stored an MD5 hash without any salt, of your password, which means any rainbow table with MD5, which is one of the, the older hashes that has been rainbowed to death, can be used to look up your password. So, not so good. Uh, all they had to do was salt it. Just add some salt to the hash, and then rainbow tables wouldn't be, you know, pre-computer rainbow tables couldn't be used, but they didn't do that. So you just, you, you, so anyone who has access to the raw data would, would take this, the, the MD5 hash of your password, look it up in an online rainbow table, which would give them the password, and then they put that in, which it then SHA1 hashes to get the decryption key, and it, they can decrypt your data. So it's, you know, it's better than nothing, but 
they could have easily made it a little stronger. And I mean, any any listener to this podcast knows, you know, twenty five ways that these things could be made stronger. But the authors of these programs apparently don't or didn't care. Now that one is free. Everything we've talked about so far is free. Also under Brand Challenged is for nine ninety nine. It's something you'd you pay ten dollars for and think, oh well, you know, if it's if it's ten bucks, it must be better. This one is called Splash ID Safe. Splash ID Safe for iPhone. Now this uses Blowfish rather than AES, um, and it's one of a several, only a few that do use Blowfish. Blowfish is interesting. It was designed by our friend Bruce Schneier. In, back in 1993, so it's been around a long time, and it has withstood all attack. It's, the, the problem with Blowfish is that it uses a rel- – because it's so old, it uses a smaller block size. It's a 64-bit symmetric cipher, meaning you put in 64 bits at a time and get out a different 64 bits. That's significant because there aren't – you know, there are – we know that there are 4 billion combinations of 32 bits. That means there's 16 billion billion combinations of 64. Once upon a time, back in 93, when Bruce did that, that was enough. But that was, that's a long time ago in terms of you know, computing power explosion. So 64 bits block ciphers are really no longer considered secure enough for industrial work. But what... what is significant about this is that it uses a highly complex key setup, which is to say, remember the way these these ciphers work is that you you there's something called a key schedule is the technical term. The idea being you take the key and you do a bunch of stuff to it to create some some raw data based on the key, which is then used, for example, by, by successive rounds of the key, this is the way AES, for example, works, where it's like it's a, an 11 round uh, process for, I think it's AES 128 uses 11 rounds. Each of those 11 rounds uses different data from the key setup. Well, normally a cipher wants a fast key setup. That is, it doesn't want much overhead associated with, with getting going. Blowfish has a particularly onerous key setup that involves uh, pre-processing of a, of a block of about 4K. So it's very slow to set up the key. But that's a good thing when you're wanting to prevent guessing because any brute forcing is na- by its nature requiring you to, to, to try this key, which means you got to go through all this, in this case with Blowfish, a lot of work to get the, this thing set up. So all of this sounds really good. In fact, I, I should mention that OpenBSD uses for some of its security Blowfish on purpose because it's so complex. It's just burdensome to, to guess what the key is. So all of this good stuff was used by Splash ID Safe for iPhone for $10. After they did all this, the master password... <laughs> is encrypted mm-hmm. under Blowfish. You're, you're giggling, Leo. I can just tell you know, something like, bad's coming. I, I, some, something bad's yeah, coming. Yeah. Master password is encrypted under Blowfish using a fixed key, hmm. which is, I, I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll spare everyone go, saying upper and lower case. But so it's G dot semicolon five nine question mark circumflex forward slash zero n one x asterisk <laughs> left curly o q i r w y now clearly someone went to some serious trouble right. coming up with That's that a nice random password and it's, it's always the same <laughs> on every <laughs> it's built it. i know i know it's built into the software that's the magic key so when, when someone sees that you're using Splash ID Safe, for which you paid $10, and wow. they have access to your raw data, wow. they go, oh. Well, and they simply use Blowfish to decrypt 
the stored encrypted key using that secret magic phrase, then that gives them your actual Blowfish key, which allows them to decrypt all your data. So it doesn't matter how long it takes Blowfish to get going and set up its key schedule because they don't only have to do it once because they can decrypt your key using the secret passphrase built into the application. Not so good. So now, under useful security, the good news is the bulk of the password managers are there under this category. Um, pa but unfortunately, there are still some problems. A, a free version called Password Safe, uh, and it says I Pass Safe free version. It uses AES 256, so nice big key, uh, and it uses encryption in CBC, cipher block chaining. The master key is randomly generated. So it pseudo randomly generates a master key, then encrypts that using the user's password, the user's master password, and that's what it stores. So that's nice. But the master password is not hashed. It's it is directly it is directly um, encrypted. It's padded out to 32 bytes because we have a we have a 256, we have we have a AES 256, so that's 32 bytes used for the key. But most users are not going to use a 32 character key. They're going to use you know whatever whatever they think is enough. You know who knows? Say say they were to say they used 10 characters, which is probably more than usual. Well, that means that we actually need we need 32. And the user gave us 10. So it would be nice if they hashed it. Then they'd come up with instantly 256 bits of garbage looking stuff where, you know, like the output of the hash is just going to be debris, but it's going to be based on what you gave it. No, these people just use it directly. They pad it out with with nothing, essentially zeros, to the full 32 bytes. And that's what they encrypt. So the problem is, it's although you would have to be doing AES two fifty six decryptions, you what the idea would be you would you would guess a password with AES two fifty six and decrypt it. The instant you see that the end is all zeros, you know you guessed right. So it it gives you I mean it's it's nice encryption. It does require you to use AES-256. You can, however, do this in an offline attack. So if you got a hold of the data, you take this somewhere with GPUs that are set up for a fast AES decryption, and you, you, and you can do this in parallel. You start pounding on it, and, and the instant you decrypt such that you, the whole end, the tail of this is all zeros, you you are can be very sure that you've got a candidate at least. So it makes it very quick to 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 crack this un, under testing, you know, un, un, under brute force if you wanted to. Still, I mean, it's 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 not bad and it's free. So it certainly it beats the pants off of the any of the other free things that we've looked at so far. Um, there's my eyes only secure password manager stores the master password. The answer to the secret password recovery question, and it uses RSA for some, for, and it's unique in that it's the only one that we looked at that uses both. It uses an asymmetric encryption, uses RSA public and private keys, and it stores all those in the iOS keychain. So iOS manages some of the data for this password manager, which provides some good security. Um, iOS keychain has different attributes that you can store things under. Um, this is stored under the attribute of accessible when unlocked. So when you unlock your phone using the normal procedure, then the, these things stored in the keychain are accessible to 
the password manager, which is reasonable, um, which means when it's not unlocked, then they're they're encrypted securely. Um, so it does mean, though, that if you had an unencrypted backup, then that that, that would be a problem. So the problem is the users, all of that same data, the master password, the secret recovery question, and the RSA public and private keys are also all, for some reason, encrypted in the same database using RSA. But it's only 512 bits. And we were just talking recently about how 768 had been cracked, and it gets much easier to crack it as these as the RSA modulus shrinks. So this is only 512-bit RSA, not really strong enough because factoring 512 bits is now feasible and is getting more so all the time. So it's, again, you've got some good security, but it's like, okay, why didn't they use 1024 or 2048? Because it doesn't take that long to do it with, with with the contemporary devices. Um, Striplight password manager uses AES-256 encryption. And these guys did a good job. It's one of the, the, the first that is really pretty strong. They, they compute the encryption key using password strengthening, that PBKDF2, 4,000 times. So... Um, uh, so they uh, using the master password that the user provided and a per database salt. So again, they 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 protect themselves from any pre computation attacks um, and do this four thousand round password strengthening. So you know that looks pretty good. Um, Safe Wallet password manager for four dollars uses AES two fifty six encryption also and they do also password strengthening 10 times. So not quite as strong as strip light, but, but still pretty strong. Um, Data Vault Password Manager uses AES-128 encryption in ECB, that's electronic code book mode, where there isn't any block-to-block -block chaining. You just use, you use each block and, and encrypt it separately, which is probably fine uh, for, for this kind of data. Um, uh, they they encrypt the key um, using the master password, padded out to 16 bytes. So that's a little bit of a concern because when when we when we don't hash and we just pad, then then it is possible, as, as we saw earlier, to quickly determine whether. We, we've, we've hit the right password because we're going to end up with an obviously padded result and not just, just pseudo-random noise in, the, in our test decryption. Um, but uh, they also use the iOS keychain to store everything, so uh, they're pretty safe. M-Secure Password Manager for $10 uses Blowfish encryption. Uh, the encryption key is an SHA-256 hash of the master password. So that's pretty strong. Uh, they, uh, they do password verification by, a, by performing a trial decryption of a known verification value for comparison. So when, they, when you enter your password, they, they hash it and then perform a trial decryption of something whose, val whose decrypted value they know and if it matches, then it's safe. So that means, okay, they you could perform an offline attack. Password recovery would require one SHA-256 process and a Blowfish key setup. And that's significant because that's very slow. So I think M-Secure looks like they did a good job. Um, and finally, LastPass, which is, as we know, a, a dollar per month for the, for the premium, LastPass premium. Uh, but they use the same technology even for, for, for their free, uses AES-256 encryption, so nice, strong key. Um, they use an SHA-256 hash of the username plus the password. So that's got the advantage 
of probably being longer than if you were just using the password. Essentially, the username becomes the salt when you're entering the password every time after you've set it up. And they verify by, by decrypting um, the 256 hash of the encryption key. Um, so uh, password recovery for LastPass requires two SHA 256 hashes and an AES 256 uh, decryption. So that's also pretty strong. So, you know, we, what we see is there are, there are some password utilities which have done a very good job. There are some that have tried but have made some simple mistakes that render them essentially useless because it's very easy to look up the password or decrypt their secret key because they encrypted it with something that was known, even though it was random gibberish. It's like, okay, well, this is, you know, a reverse engineer's joy. Um, and there are many that perform no encryption at all. Everything is stored in plain text. The password just is checked to see if it's the same as what you put in before. And if it is, it lets you look at your data, um, you and anybody else uh, who might have it. So, so this so strength varies ac across the complete spectrum. There's no way to know what what you've got unless someone unless they disclose to you exactly what algorithm they are using, which would be nice. Uh, most people don't. They just say, "Oh, you know, military grade encryption." You know, if they have any encryption. Again, as we know, as we well know from the podcast, just saying that means nothing. Because you may have, you may be using military grade encryption, but you know storing the 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 unencrypted data uh, in the file. So it just uh, shows how tricky it is. Yes, you know, I mean it's not. It's just, you can know you can know a lot and still do it wrong. Yes, it is very simple. We see that all the time. People doing a good job with encryption and making a simple mistake that allows the bad guys to get around it. Did you look at one pass? I think uh, it's called one password. One, well, because that's uh, kind uh, of the best known. Um, yeah, um, one password. One password. That's it. Yes, one is the numeral one yeah. password. Yeah, and they're good people. I did look at it. Uh, I looked at their several of their blog entries. Um, the this report from um, from Elkomsoft was a little harsh about them. Really. Um, well, because they're, they're probably the the number one uh, iOS well, password manager. Yes, and and they are they are absolutely strong. Uh, uh, they're as strong as any of the good ones. Oh, okay. And from looking at the blog postings, they're going to make it stronger. Um, they weren't, as I recall, they weren't doing any password strengthening. Though all of their crypto w w was was absolutely good and solid. Mm -hmm. um, I can probably. I didn't have it in my notes, but I think I've got the I've got it right here in front of me. Um, the Elkomsoft deal. Uh, what they said about one password. Um, yeah, one password pro is fourteen ninety nine, and uh, it actually uses uh, a bunch of MD five hashes with salt, so rainbow tables cannot be applied. Um, and it uses AES-128 encryption to, to generate um, database keys and, and strong validation. And I do know from reading their blogs that if they haven't already, they're just in the process of adding some good strengthening to, to bring it up to speed. But I was impressed by everything that I saw on, on their website. So I think 1Password Pro uh, is it, it looks like it's the priciest one of the ones we've seen, but they've done a good job. So I, I, I would absolutely trust them. There, there is no, there's no back door, no, no sh shortcut um, into, um, uh, into passwords stored with them. So takeaways are that many popular password storage apps provide little or no actual security. They're just, it's, Pure eyewash. It just prevents you, the user, from, <laughs> like from you know, eyewash, <laughs> <laughs> from getting past the front door. Uh, but anyone with access to it, an unencrypted backup, or to the um, to the device itself, if it's not locked, or if there's a way that that can be that the lock can be bypassed, 
although we see that Apple has done a very good job with that on the later devices. Um, uh, many of them just won't prevent you from getting in at all. Um, we see that Apple's own protection is typically far superior to what it, it, what certainly some of these pa pa password uh, software provides, but the better ones that we talked about really, I mean, it requires full-on, you know, brute force crypto in order to, to crack them. So you want to use a good, strong password. That, that advice still applies. Um, and so, you know, Apple users, and, and same thing for BlackBerry users. BlackBerry also does good, you know, BlackBerry's been, you know, a, a crypto leader for a long time. Um, so they want, uh, so, so they use actually twice the password strengthening that Apple does. They use 20,000 iterations of the, uh, um, the uh, st strengthening algorithm in order to generate their final key. Not that it really matters because you just do that once. Um, and all you really see from a UI standpoint is a slight pause as it accepts your key, which is entirely acceptable because, you know, the, the bad guy is going to face that pause for e every single time they guess. And so you want them to be slowed down. So complex backup passwords use the, the best, strongest daily unlocking passcode you can and length matters. So, you know, do something easy to do, but hard to guess. Uh, especially when the bad guy doesn't know what you've done, um, uh, and absolutely encrypt your backups, and and you know listen to this podcast <laughs> for more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know you use one of the better password managers. Yeah, yeah. LastPass continues to uh, impress. Yep, they they you know they understand crypto. They've made no mistakes. Yeah, and uh, they're cro totally cross platform. A buck a month for the pro, which you don't even have to pay for, but it's worth. Yep, uh, I think that's that's probably a good choice. What I use, yeah. Thank you so much, Steve Gibson. He is the man in charge at GRC.com, the Gibson Research Corporation. That's uh, that's where you'll find him. You'll find him on Twitter at sggrc or at sgpad, and I presume you're putting some stuff up there because of your new iPad. Yep. Have been uh, lots of thoughts there, um, and uh, don't forget Spinrite, please. The world's finest hard drive maintenance utility. That's at grc.com. The one thing he charges you for. Everything else is free. Lots of freebies, including Shields Up, which everybody knows, but lots of free uh, security programs, utilities, information about things like password haystacks, which uh, Steve referred to. Uh, if you want to know more, that's there. And don't forget uh, that uh, there are 16 kilobit versions of this show for those of you with bandwidth caps or bandwidth impaired or on dial-up, uh, as well as full transcripts at grc.com. We have the uh, audio and video at our site, twit.tv, and we do this show every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, if you'd like to watch live. Next week, Q&A, and if you've got a question for Steve, go to grc.com slash feedback, and I'm sure he's collecting them even as we speak. Thanks, Steve. We'll, we'll see you uh, next week. Thanks, Leo, on Security Now. Security Now.